What is your greatest heart's desire? That one thing that fills your thoughts moment after moment. That's next, The Prophetic Connection. This place, the Mount of Olives, very near. Fulfilling the prophecy, waiting for the day when the Messiah will come. If you had asked the Apostle Paul to describe his heart's desire, he would have answered this way, because it's written plain, Romans chapter 10 in verse one. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. That was Paul's heart's desire, but it was at the same time his prayer. He prayed that all Israel might know the Messiah that he had met in the person of Jesus Christ. Now I'm back at Caesarea, the Roman port city, uh, where Paul was imprisoned for at least two years before he was taken on a ship to Rome and to judgment. Paul appeared here before Felix the governor, who was replaced by Festus. And in fact, he actually appeared before King Agrippa and his wife Bernice. And he recounted the story of his conversion, uh, how he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. But what Paul can't understand is, after this time, why more Jewish people have not embraced Jesus as their Messiah. In fulfillment of all the prophets had said, and especially when he did so many miracles among them. This was Paul's struggle, and it continues through chapter 10 and into chapter 11. Why isn't all of Israel saved through faith in Jesus of Nazareth? While the Apostle Paul's preaching about Jesus was warmly received by most Gentiles, he received a very different reception from Jews in synagogues. Most Jews did not believe Paul's claim that Jesus was their long-awaited Messiah. This widespread rejection of Jesus as Messiah by Jews left Paul with an unfulfilled longing in his heart. The longing in Paul's heart, he says with his own words that I, I would I hope that they would come to salvation, that they would come to the knowledge of the Messiah. And I, I believe this was the longing in his heart that the, the reality that was before him of uh, difficulty with accepting this message would be wiped away and it would become easy for them to receive this message that Yeshua, Jesus came and was the promised Messiah of the Jewish people. But why was Jewish acceptance of Jesus as Messiah so important to Paul when his message about Jesus was being warmly received in most Gentile, non-Jewish settings? According to what he wrote, the Apostle Paul's longing was to see his own people saved. He would have given up his own salvation to see the salvation of his people, the Jewish people. And I think that was really one of the deepest personal things that was always burning in the heart of the Apostle Paul. Why did Jews in general reject Jesus as their promised Messiah? In Romans chapter 10, Paul says that the nation of Israel sought its own righteousness through the works of the law, as opposed to finding righteousness in, through faith in their promised Messiah. That was the primary reason why he was rejected. The other thing would be a misconception of what the Old Testament prophets meant by the Messiah who would be in David's line, he would be a king like David. In their minds, a king like David was not so much uh, the shepherd of the sheep and playing his harp and worshiping God in that quiet place, but actually he was a conqueror. He would defeat all the enemies. And so they were now under Roman oppression. And so they expected that the Messiah would come. He would de defeat the Romans and uh, they would have their own nation again in their homeland that was promised to them. Did Jews reject Jesus as their promised Messiah simply because his words and actions fell short of their expectations? Or could their strict belief system and concept of God have been contributing factors?
The majority of the Jews in the days of Paul rejected Jesus as Messiah because they were seeking a righteousness that came from the law that had been given to their people through Moses. The 613 commandments of the Torah uh, were um, really, they, they interpreted them in a legalistic way and they believed by literally obeying, finding a way to fulfill each one of these commandments that they could earn their righteousness with God. And so the idea of getting an imputed uh, and imparted uh, righteousness through faith in the Messiah really was, uh, was just a step too far for them. Why was it so difficult for Jews to accept Jesus as the promised Messiah, especially when they saw his power to do miracles? In this time of history, when Paul is writing his letters and we see him speaking to Gentile believers as well as, as Jewish believers, I believe what's happening in the background is Jewish people are, that are, are hearing the gospel are struggling with how to marry Judaism with this new idea of the Messiah has come and it brings new paradigms. And we see it, for instance, in, in, in the Apostle Peter, where he's, he's sitting on the rooftop and he has this vision and he's been called to the house of a Gentile. Now for a Jewish man, you wouldn't enter the house of a Gentile. So now he's faced with a paradigm between this new idea of faith going to all peoples that bumps up against his understanding as a Jewish man of how he should live and interact. And I believe a lot of Jewish people in this period of time are, are bumping up and up against this reality of how do we deal with these things. And that's what's making probably the most difficult struggle for Jews to accept faith at this time. Was it realistic for Jews to think that they could keep the law of Moses in all respects? I think the Bible makes it clear that it's impossible, humanly impossible, to keep all of the commandments of God, particularly in a legalistic way. You're gonna kill yourself through trying to figure out exactly what is required and what's not as required. And what Paul writes is that Christ, the Messiah, is the end, but really it means the perfection of the law. Jesus takes the lawfulness of God to the perfect level, and that's why we need the law of the Spirit. We need amazing grace in order to walk in the lawfulness of God that is represented by our Messiah. Is it possible to keep the law in, in all of its respects? Only one person has done it. Um, and short of Yeshua, short of Jesus, I think what, what the Apostle Paul tells us in his writings, he said, all have sinned, all have fallen short. So I think for humanity, it's not possible for us to keep the law in its entirety. I, I think from, from our first breath, we are leaned towards sin, and that basically disqualifies us from being able to keep the law in its entirety. And I think that's what Paul teaches. Paul knew from personal experience just how difficult it was to obey the law of Moses in all respects. This is why the concept of salvation through faith in Christ seems so logical to his religious and educated mind, especially after his conversion experience. Paul talks about the law being good. It's the law of God, not just the law of Moses. And Paul, being a Pharisee and very diligent to keep the law, admits in Romans chapter 7 that he still struggles in obeying God perfectly. He. Uh, sees this law or this tendency of sin working in his inner being that causes him to disobey God, even though he desires to. He doesn't have the power to obey the law. Don't go away. After this short break, Dr. John Twee returns with his teaching. As we've already seen in episode one, based on Romans chapter nine, Paul the apostle had a great struggle going on within himself, probably went on for years because he couldn't understand how he, a Jew, had accepted Jesus as the promised Messiah in fulfillment of all the prophets had said, while the majority of his fellow countrymen, other Jewish people, had rejected Jesus as the Messiah even though he was crucified outside the walls of Jerusalem. 
So Paul has this ongoing debate within himself. Where does Israel stand with God since they have not embraced Jesus of Nazareth as their Messiah? Now, as we continue in chapter 10, he expresses his heart's desire and prayer to God that all Israel might be saved. In fact, in chapter nine, he said he would gladly change places with Israel if they would discover salvation in Christ. He would give up his own salvation if that could happen. That's an incredible statement that he makes there. He would be the exchange in order for all Israel to be saved. Now, as we continue in chapter 10, we try to unlock the mysteries of why Israel has not fully embraced Jesus as their Messiah. Now, I'm standing at Caesarea, the Roman port city, which was very important where Paul is concerned because he was imprisoned here for two years. And over my shoulder in the distance, you can see tall pillars. Those represent the palace of Herod the Great. And Caesarea, especially the harbor that he had built here, was one of his crowning achievements. This man accomplished so much in a single lifetime. Now, he was at the same time a terrible tyrant, but his engineering um, visions and abilities um, have stood the test of time. We're now 2,000 years later from Herod's time, and here we have the ruins, and um, you can see the mosaic floors over there where the pillars are, and there, there is the remains of a swimming pool as well. And somewhere behind me, uh, just toward those pillars was the judgment hall. And I'm sure that Paul, when he stood in judgment before uh, Felix the governor, who was then replaced by Festus, and then eventually before King Agrippa, that those judgments took place over there. And it was, of course, here that Paul appealed to Caesar. Um, he could do that as a Roman citizen. And the Jews in Jerusalem had plotted to kill him. In fact, they wanted to bring him back to Jerusalem for trial, but they, he was kept here for his own safety. And then having, in fact, King Agrippa says that Paul was so persuasive, he would have set him free on the spot, except he'd already appealed to Caesar's court, which meant that Paul would have to go to Rome. But even that was prophesied because the Lord appeared by Paul and told him that that was in his future. So now as we continue in Romans chapter 10, um, he continues his arguments. Verse two, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. The Jewish people have a zeal, but not according to knowledge, certainly not according to the knowledge that Paul has found in Jesus of Nazareth. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, and seeking to establish their own righteousness, Paul means through the law of Moses, have not submitted to the righteousness of God, which in fact has been provided through Jesus the Savior. And then he says this in verse four, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And Paul saying, you can't possibly be, spite, be saved by the law because you cannot keep the law in all completeness but you can be saved by faith in the righteousness that is in Christ because he took your shortcomings to the cross and covered your shortcomings by the shedding of his blood. So this is a debate about the righteousness the Jewish people find through the law over and against the righteousness that can be found only by faith. And in this case, faith in Jesus of Nazareth. And then verse five, for Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law, the man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. And Paul goes on and in verse eight, he says, but what does it say? Meaning in the scripture, the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart, but it is the word of faith which we preach. So he's back to the need for faith. And he's actually quoting directly from the law from Deuteronomy 30, verse 14. And then he goes on to explain how salvation is found. Verse nine, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. 
And then Paul makes his appeal to scripture. Having said that, he appeals to something that Isaiah the prophet wrote. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. But this was a prophecy uttered by Isaiah, and Isaiah could not have fully understood even what he was saying, even as he gave this prophecy. It's recorded in Isaiah 28, verse 16, and chapter 49, verse 23. And then Paul says, verse 12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. So now Paul has stressed the importance of faith. But now faith must be demonstrated because we must call upon the Lord in order to be saved through faith. And it's another quote from the Old Testament from the book of Joel, chapter two, verse 32. Paul says, quoting Joel, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now we see Paul's logic kicking in. He said, faith is important, but we must call upon the name of the Lord. Well, then he asks another rhetorical question in verse 14. How then shall they call in him in whom they have not believed? So he's pointing to Israel and saying, how will you call on him if you have not first believed that he is who the prophet said he would be the Messiah of Israel? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So Paul's emphasis is preachers must preach in order for people to hear, in order to call upon the name of the Lord, in order to exercise their faith, which is not faith according to keeping the law of Moses, but it's the faith of a heart that believes in God through Jesus Christ. And then this, in verse 15, the logic continues. And how shall they preach unless they're sent, as it is written? And once and again, Paul quotes Isaiah. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Now remember, these prophets of Israel were prophesying in the Old Testament period before Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea but they're prophesying the word of God. Obviously a word of God they don't even fully understand because the Christ hasn't come yet. And so we don't have the New Testament um, teachings, but they are prophesying as God gives them utterance of things that are going to come, even though they don't fully or couldn't fully understand the things that they're prophesying. And then quoting Isaiah again, in that chapter 53, of the suffering servant that was to come, which describes in detail, and we can only see it from a New Testament perspective, describes in detail the lamb that would be taken to the slaughter. And for us uh, in our New Testament context, of course, Isaiah was prophesying about the coming of Jesus, who would be the lamb of God, who would lay down his life for the sins of the world. But Isaiah prophesied his coming in chapter 53. And then, verse 17, so they, then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed, their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the end, ends of the world. And that's a quote from Psalm 19, verse four. And then he asks again, he's back to Israel again. But I say, did Israel not know First, Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. And here we get hints of the fact that Paul may be now understanding that God has a purpose in all of this, even in Israel's rejection of Jesus as the Messiah. And of course, that will be more fully explored in the next chapter as Paul finally understands Israel's place. But here we get a hint that God is, they're the chosen people. And so now God is turning his attention to the Gentile world who are not the chosen people to provoke Israel to jealousy by reaching out to the Gentiles. And once again in verse uh, 20, but Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. 
presumably the Gentiles, and I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. And this is a direct quote from Isaiah 65, verse 1. And then verse 21, but to Israel, he says, all day long, I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Isaiah 65, verse 2. So it sounds like an indictment for, of Israel, but I don't think it's quite that. I think this is Paul reasoning, trying to understand where the Jewish people are. And if they're not going to accept Christ, why is that? And does God not have a plan of salvation for them? Well, we'll answer that question after this short break. Before the break, we asked the question, since Israel, in a general sense, rejected Jesus as the Messiah promised by the prophets of the Old Testament, does this then mean that God, in turn, has rejected Israel? Now, that question will be answered more fully in the next episode in Romans chapter 11. But I think here we can look at what Paul is doing as he continues this debate seemingly in his own mind, as he wrestles with uh, the contrast between keeping the law or believing by faith, or the Jewish people as the chosen generation, but now it seems God is turning to the Gentiles who were not chosen, uh, but he's doing it for reason to provoke Israel to jealousy. Now, standing here at Caesarea where Paul was a prisoner, uh, for at least two years because we know he was here when Felix was the governor and we know that Felix was replaced by Festus uh, two years later and Paul actually appeared before Felix and Festus and then while Festus was governor he actually ap appeared before King Agrippa who came from Jerusalem to Caesarea. And as I said earlier in the episode uh, Herod's palace uh, is represented by the pillars. That was the entrance way, and beyond the pillars, the swimming pool. I mean, this was, uh, in the first century, about 20,000 people lived here. It was a fully functioning Roman port city, and the capital of Rome in what was then Israel. Uh, you can't see it, but perhaps the camera will get a, a shot of it afterwards. Just below me is the Hippodrome, where the chariot races took place. Um, you can think of the film Ben-Hur, which uh, illustrated a chariot race so well, and of course, uh, gladiatorial fights and all of that. Um, but, and a theater, and I mean, this was a large, fully functioning Roman city. And it was a port city for that reason, um, and that's why the Romans chose it as their headquarters, because their ships could come and go from here, either bringing goods or taking spices back to, uh, to Rome, or soldiers could come and go as well. So circumstances had it that Paul was here for at least two years in prison. And perhaps during that time, he had lots of time to think about what is Israel standing before God? My heart's desire is that they should be saved, but they are not saved and why are they not saved? So in Romans chapter 10, the debate between keeping the law of Moses or believing by faith, by calling on the name of the Lord. But that can't happen unless someone uh, preaches him to you and then you respond to that. So this is all taking place here. But I think the point that we want to make is that Israel broke God's heart time and time again. Even though he was in a covenant relationship with them, they broke his heart by running after idols. And now it seems God is going to show Israel the error of their way. And he's going to provoke them to jealousy because they who are the chosen people, he is now turning his attention to the Gentile world. Um, and it, Romans chapter 10 finishes with this verse, but to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people, meaning, 
Um, time and again, Israel violated her vows um, and her contract, her covenant contracts with God. So now God is going to make them jealous by turning his attention to the Gentile world. But is Israel's future bleak because of that? No, it's not. And we'll discover Israel's glorious future in the very next episode. Thanks for watching The Prophetic Connection and join us next week for Israel's Glorious Future.